Well, good morning, Mr. Ferguson. Today is Saturday, 22 September 2018. We're out in Noakesville at the open house at the tank farm. Uh And I'm doing an interview with Mr. Glenn Ferguson. Good morning, sir. If you could just say for the camera your full name and your date of birth, please. Glenn M. Ferguson. And where were you born, Mr. Ferguson? A place called Pogues Mill, Virginia. Okay, okay. It's, and, a, it's, it's out from Roanoke back in there. Okay. And what war did you participate in? World War II. And I, I see your, your hat, that's uh, impressive, World War II. Well, we're gonna talk about that. Did you have any family members that served in the military as well? My brother. Your brother? He was in the 83rd Division. Okay. And another brother, he was in the Air Force. Okay. Were these brothers older or younger? They're younger. younger I mean brother. older. Older, okay. And what, what, were their, what were their names? One was Buford, half-brother, Buford Smallwood. Okay. And Shannon Ferguson. Okay. And um, anybody else, like your dad or, or grandparents, military? Well, um, and. Uh, I'm t- I could try to think. I really don't know any, any others. Not in World War II. And my, my uncle was in World War I. Oh, your uncle was in World War I, okay. Uh huh. Okay. And my father was too old for World War II and too young for World War I. Okay. No, that's, that's good. That's good. And we'll talk about your, your brother in a little bit here, too. So, <clears throat> can you remember where you were on December 7th, 1941? Yeah, when the war started, you mean? Yes, with the, when the Japanese bombed. I was I was working at Harold Johnson's restaurant. Okay. I was out in the yard picking up trash, and the boy come out and said, "Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor." We looked at him. I said, "Where in the heck is Pearl Harbor? Never heard of it." Yeah. December seventh, nineteen forty-one. Yeah, and so you were probably about nineteen. Uh, 20, I was, I was 20, about 21. Something like around there. Yeah. And then, uh, so what happened the next couple of days after Pearl Harbor? Well, I, we kept working. And, uh, of course, I was I was too young for the service. Then I was I was working, at, you know what AP Hill is? Yes. I was working at AP Hill with the GIs when I registered for the draft. Okay. And they had a man come over and I registered right there. Well, so did you did you end up getting drafted or did you? I wound up getting drafted. Drafted. And what what year was it that you got drafted? Forty three. Forty two. Let's see. Forty three. Four five. Forty three. Okay. January forty three. I went in. And uh, you were drafted in, into what specialty or or MOS? Well, I was a rifleman. What do you call it? Infantryman, rifleman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but number was 745. That was a rifleman. A 745? It was a rifleman. Okay. And can you tell me a little bit about your your training? Well, I was training in the Camp, Camp Wheeler, Georgia. Camp Wheeler, Georgia? Okay. Yeah. And what was that like? Or how, it looked pretty rough. Pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, I had a a corporal Dixon, I think his name. Corporal, he was my, corporal Dixon. Yeah, and I come out of the hospital in France in 19. I was in the hospital and I looked over the street corner and there stood in France. The same guy. And he remembered me. He remembered you. Yeah, we got talking. The same guy from basic training. He he was my instructor. Yeah. And you ran into him in uh, Perdon, France. France. Wow. Do you remember how long your training was? Thirteen weeks, I think. Thirteen it was. weeks down in, uh, and this was January in in uh, Georgia. Georgia. Okay, so you finished the training, and then uh, what happened after that? Well, I got, uh, I think it was well, we transferred up to Fort Meade, Maryland. Fort Meade. No, yeah. Then I was also in. Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Okay. 
and one of them, I was in Cape Kilmer, New Jersey. Okay, New Jersey, yeah. Yeah. Was this all for more training, or this was just getting ready to get, go? Getting ready. To, then we went to Camp Shanks, New York. Okay. And that's where they sent us overseas. Put us on the Queen Mary. Oh, wow. How was the Queen Mary? Yeah. A lot of a lot of soldiers on the Queen Mary? They said it was something like 20,000 GIs. Wow. And, and 100 girls. 100 girls. And there's nurses and Red Cross. How long did the trip take to get to? Um, About five and a half days. Okay. And where did to you, Scotland. To Scotland. Okay. Uh -huh. Anything stand out from the ship or from Scotland? No, not really. And then I understand that they put you into the 26th? 20, 26th Division. 26th Infantry Division. Where did you join up with the 26th? In France. In France. Tell us a little bit about arriving in France and joining your unit, please. Well, I remember that France and put it in and this assigned us to a different division, but I joined up in Germany. Okay. The 26 was already over in Germany, a place called Saar Lallen, Saar oh. Union, Saar Guinness. Okay. That was in Germany, though. That was in Germany. So this probably was later in, uh, in 1944. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Did you see... Um, Combat action, fighting. Oh yeah, I've seen plenty of that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of what your unit did? Well, we used to go up to the schoolhouse and shoot out the window to houses across the river. And then we'd duck back between the windows and watch the bullets going hit the wall behind us, and the plaster flying off the wall. And things like that. With the Germans on the on the other side of the. They river. was on the other side of the house over there. Med shoot back at us. Wow. And and I think at the time, what what was your rank at the time? Then I was a private. Private. Yeah, I went overseas, private. And you got promoted later, right? Right, later. What was that like getting promoted? Oh, it wasn't, wasn't bad. It was good. A little more money. Huh? A little bit more money. Yeah, it was. Uh, Let's see, ten dollars for combat pay overseas pay, and ten dollars for. Let's see, I, I was getting a uh, fifty, sixty, seventy, seventy-four dollars a month when I got out. Okay. Well, what else about your combat time in in Germany stands out? Well, most of it's like I told that one guy laying in that ditch on the side of the road. And I, was, I could have swore, all them bullets going overhead and around, I could have swore I was going to die right there. That's the first time I ever said I was really scared. I would tell my mama bye, and I loved her, and she'd never see me again, but I'm still here. <laughs> so was that a pretty big battle with yeah, the yeah, Germans, was, or a small? Yeah, we was out in this field, mm -hmm. this whole dirt road. And dirt road, okay. I was trying to squeeze up in the covert, and I lay on my stomach like this, and I didn't want to lose no arms. Right. But that was, that was the only time I was really, I mean, I was really scared. And the rest you, of the time I wasn't that scared. Were you with your other soldiers too? Well, I, I don't know what my digging buddy was, but I had a corporal, corporal Baker. Me and him dug foxholes together. Okay. He got shot too. But that was that the day you got shot in the. He, yeah. Well, so, t so tell us a little bit about how you got shot. And well, we was in this German foxhole, and they told us never get in the hot foxhole that a German had built. And like a nut, we got in it. And all them bullets was flying, and so the sergeant hollered up, fall back, fall back, and we'd come back to town. And him and I jumped out of that foxhole and started across that field, and they both got hit. And I understand you, you got shot in the leg? Leg and the foot. Leg and the foot? Uh-huh. And then how were you able to get back to the to Oh, I line? made it. But when that hit me, I, I knew something hit me, and I made a turn and went right straight for the aid station. Okay. And they went on and they took my boot off and cleaned me up. I think and you, put me on the stretcher with me and him and took us across the river to another town over there. 
Okay, so they evacuated back a little bit. Uh huh. And was this? Did you end up in the hospital in Luxembourg from this wound? Yeah, they took me to Luxembourg. So tell us a little bit about your time in Luxembourg. Well, uh, by that time it was hurting real bad. The next day, and uh, they, they took me up and put on the hospital bed, and they're going to give me a shot in the, in the shoulder. And I said, what's that for? I said, we're going to put you to sleep. I said, you're going to put me to sleep. You might cut my leg off. So they gave me a shot in the hip, and it numbed everything all the way down. And I sat up just like this and watched them work on me. Okay. Sat right there. And it looks like they did a good job. They did. Yeah. They took a thing that looked like a great big Q-tip, stuck it in one side and swabbed it out and cleaned it, my foot and my leg. Were you able to return back to duty? Yeah, I went to Berlin Price. I was in the hospital about three weeks. Okay. Then I went back. To, they sent me back to my outfit. And I think, wound up in Czechoslovakia. Okay. I think I heard you say before, too, there was a funny story about a nurse in the Luxembourg hospital waking, yeah. waking you up. Can you tell us about that? Well, I was laying in the hospital bed, and this nurse come in and says, you want to give me a shave and a bath. I said, well, I ain't had enough to eat for a long time. I like to have something to eat. She went off and got brought me a plate of food. Then she said, you want to shave the bath? I said, I like to sleep a little bit. I've been sleeping on the damn ground, in the basement of the houses, on potato piles and everything. So I went to sleep. Sometime later, I woke up and I laying back there and I had a ring on this hand. I had my hand behind me like a kiss. And I felt somebody playing with that ring, going around and around. And I looked up, and she's ahead of the bed, and I'm her she wasn't two foot from my place. And I swear, I thought I'd die and gone to heaven. Wow. I thought I'd look at that angel. <laughs> she was nice. <coughs> and she says, you want that bath now? <laughs> I said, I guess so. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, that's good. They took, boy. they took care of it, then you got, so you got back to your unit. Uh -huh. you, now you're, you're back in Germany still, right? Yeah, right. And did you do some more fighting with your unit? Yeah, we well, that's when I went back to Germany, then I wound up in Czechoslovakia. Okay. Um, did you ever run into any German soldiers, like German prisoners, or talk to any Germans? Oh, yeah. After the war, we had a, a German that camped up there where we kept up, and had a German soldier that used to stay with us. He put gas in our trucks and everything, and men here used to go over the mountain and get the mail, and he'd, okay. he'd ride with me. Shorty, I called him. <laughs> Shorty? Shorty. Because <laughs> he, he was really tall or really short? He was short. Uh -huh. And the, he was, the war was over now, though, right? The war was over, yeah. Okay, and you were in Czechoslovakia. Okay. Shorty. <laughs> Shorty. I understand you spent some time in, I understand you spent some time in Hungary as well? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was Hungary? I, I, I was down where Hitler's summer home was. Okay. I spent some, I was, I swear I met General Patton. Okay, tell, well, tell us about meeting General Patton. Well, he come up there, and they told us he brings his own barber. And if you need a haircut, he'd, he'd, he'd call you up there and shave your head right bare. And that's the way he did it. And if he was half done with your head, when he got, got ready to leave, he left it that way. Did you get General a haircut? Patton. Did you get a haircut? No, I got it before I went over there, but oh. they told us he would do that, so we all got us a haircut. Oh, okay. But did you get to meet General Patton? Yeah, I've seen him one time. Seen him. Did he did he talk to the soldiers or? Yeah, he sat up there and talked to us and everything. How how was that? What was it like meeting oh. him and talk get have, listen oh, to him? Oh, wasn't bad. I met a German soldier too, a German general too, von Rudenstadt. You ever hear of him? Yes. I met him. We had him sitting in the jeep. Wow. What did he say? He didn't say nothing. Just sat there. Yeah, he's pretty famous. General Van Rundstadt is a uh, very famous, very famous ge German general. Was he? Yes. Von Rudenstadt, yeah. Yeah, on the Eastern Front with the Russians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had him sit in the front seat of a Jeep. Okay. And where, where'd you take him? Do you remember? I don't know where they took him. Do you yeah. remember anything special that General Patton said? Uh, not really. He cussed a lot. He cussed a lot? Yeah, he cussed an awful lot. I heard that. <clears throat> yeah, they told us that before we went up there, and he cussed a lot. He did. Um, well, tell us a little bit about your brother in the 80, 83rd Division. Well, he, he got wounded 
six days after D-Day, <coughs> he got shot up pretty bad. Because he spent oh, a long time in the hospital in England. Then they sent him down to, what is it, Sports Story, Virginia? Yes. And they sent him down there to stay a while. So all together, he's in the hospital for, I know, close to a year, they said. Did you ever see him during uh, the wartime? No. No? Okay. I know he, he wrote me a, my brother, I was uh, down in Georgia, States of Georgia, and he wrote a letter from England to me. And I, when I got the letter, I was in Europe and he was in the United States. Okay. It, the letter had to cross the river Atlanta, uh, twice. Right, right. Okay. Well, I understand you also spent some time in Italy. Yeah, we would call it Brenner Pass. Brenner Pass. Well, tell us about the Brenner Pass. Well, we was up in Czechoslovakia. And we had about 25 Italian girls that had been with the German army. And they told us that <coughs> we was going to escort them back to Italy and not let none of them out of your sight. If they had to go to the bathroom, you go with them. <laughs> and one of the other boys with me says, they asked us, where are you taking us? And that boy said, we're going to turn you over to the Russians. And every one of them got to crying. And I went and told them, no, we're taking you to Italy. And they, mm -hmm. they shut up then. We took them down to what's called Brenner Pass in Italy and turned them over to the Italians. Italians took them? Yeah, the Italians took them. The well, Italian girls were in the German army. They, were, they, were they happy to be back in Italy? Oh, they were happy when I told them we'd take them to Italy. Not to Russia, right? Not to Russia. They were going to rush because they know the Russians are going to shoot them. Right. Right. Do you remember how you stayed in touch with, with people? Uh, you mentioned letter from your brother, but did you write to your parents back in Virginia? Oh yeah, I always wrote to them. And we didn't have to pay for a stamp here, just write free. Right, okay. Up on the corner, where the stamp was. Never paid for a stamp, write free. And what was it like getting mail? Oh, we, 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 uh, my mama wrote to me all the time. Okay. She did. Yeah. So that must have been a big day when the mail came in. Yes, it was. Did you have any um, any free time? Like, were you able to play cards or, or go to a, a movie or a USO show? Well, we had a, when I was in the hospital, they had a USO show upstairs. Okay, tell us about that. Well, the thing is, I had a girl over there. She could stand up, I mean stand up, and bend completely backwards and stick her head between her legs. Wow. She was facing the floor. That was at the USO show? That was the USO show up there. And you saw that? And I, and I saw Bob Hope, he put on the USO show down in Georgia, Francis Langford, and Jerry Colonna. Okay. They was all three down there in Georgia. I seen Bob Hope at one time. Wow. Are there any other, <clears throat> any other incidents that stand out to you, memorable moments? Well, I know we was, uh, we was in this house, we were told that last house up there was that girl, and uh, here come a whole bunch of German soldiers. It, was, it must have been about eight or ten of them. Wow. And we, they sh come by the house, we shot into them. We only killed one. But uh, the next day, here they come back bra dragging their wounded with them. And they want to surrender. Okay. They put a drag, quite drag on the rifles and wave it and come down there. Okay. And they'd give up. So did you let them surrender? Yeah, we let them surrender. Okay. There's about six or eight of them left. So this was probably... Was they this was helping some of the wounded along. <laughs> pretty, pretty late in the, in the war? I don't know how many we hit, but they, they were helping them along. Did you, you know, help get the prisoners or did somebody else take them? We, we sent them on back. And they Just took, kept sending them back. And we, up, we was going up this mountain and they had this little German soldier. He was a sniper, and he had shot a few GIs, you know. And we had him up there, and I was talking to him, and the final lieutenant told uh, one of the boys, said, I want to show you, to, to one of the boys, you take that boy for a walk, and you come back alone, or don't you come back. Wow. Well, he went off walk with him, and he come back, and I don't know what happened, that German soldier where he shot him or what. Yeah. Yeah, he told him, you come back alone, but don't come back. That was the lieutenant told him that? The lieutenant told him that. What do you think happened? 
I don't know if he shot him or not. I never did find out. Yeah. I don't think I could. I'd have probably told him to run like hell and I'd have shot off someplace else. Yeah. <coughs> um, did you did you lose some friends in, in combat? <coughs> did I lose some friends? Well, let's see. Well, I guess I did. I, I know I was, we was in what's called a black forest. It was right down the bottom of and we was on one side of the hill, and they was down like a nut they dug in right down that bridge. And next day was four of them down there dead. Then there was one up the hill, and one more on the stretch up there dead by the pillboxes. And I went in the pillbox. These were Americans or? The Americans. Yeah. Yeah. That was two, three, about five, five Americans I seen today, five or six. Well, I understand too. You had a you had to get a shovel from a, a dead soldier. Can you tell us yeah, about that? Yeah, well, I was up in the black forest to come out of that, and with me and me, we were digging inside of a hill. And I told the lieutenant, Lieutenant, I ain't got no shovel. I says, Can I take it off of that dead with GI? He said, Go ahead, and I did. I took his shovel. Cause we threw a lot of stuff away, like gas mask. Yes, we throw the gas mask away right. and use that pack just to carry. A food and stuff in. Yeah, that, that dead guy up there, there was two down that foxhole, there's three, and one up on the next to the pillbox, laying on the stretcher. Gee, I don't know how I got up on the stretcher up there. Uh, who put him up there? Did you, <coughs> did you receive any, any medals or special awards? <coughs> no, I've got. But what you call a combat badge, that was ten dollars a month. And overseas pay, that was ten dollars a month. And the PFC was four dollars a month. And it looks like you got a purple heart for your for your wounds. Yeah. And a combat infantryman's badge? Yeah, I got that. That's yeah, C I B. Um Okay, so the war ended in nineteen forty five, but it sounds like you were in uh Hungary and Czechoslovakia, Austria. Yeah. Um, when did you finally get to come home? Oh, it was uh, July of 46. July of 1946. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about coming home in, in 1946. Well, in 1946 they told us we was finally coming home and me and the boy from Lynchburg, we signed what you call three month waivers. And then we said another three months, they, then we would go read and list, and we couldn't find our currency control book where to put the money on. So I didn't read and list, but <coughs> later on he did. He stayed. Yeah, that was, that was your brother. No, it was, a, it was my digging buddy. Oh, you're digging. Okay, you're, a, a you're friend. Right. Yeah, boy from Lynchburg. Okay, how did how did you physically get home from Europe? Well, I come home on a uh, George Washington ship. Okay. Was that an aircraft carrier or a cruiser? No, it was a regular ship, passenger ship. Passenger ship. And where'd that take you to? Altogether, I've been on five ships. I've been on Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, George Washington, SS Marine Chart, and a Liberty ship. Liberty ship brought you from England to France. Well, so five ships in nine countries, right? Right. That's impressive. That's impressive. Well, Mr. Ferguson, how do you think your your World War II experience affected you for the rest of your life in your civilian your well, civilian world? It, it just, well, you have done things and seen things I've never seen before. Because we, like we was in a place called Saul Island and in row houses. Well, we wouldn't go down the street and go back and get our rations or anything because we were afraid the Germans shoot up the street. What we did, we cut a hole in the wall the whole block, the house, about five foot tall and about that wide, and we could go the whole block and never go outside. Wow. We would. We done a lot of damage to them people's houses. Right. I was in one that's where standing guard right at the top steps go down the basement, and the roof was gone over the house, and I, right on the ceiling, old, there was a German artillery shell about that long hanging about halfway through the ceiling. It didn't go off. No, I used to look up there and I said, God, I hope it don't fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I realized 
See, they had a lot of slave labor in Germany then. Yes. And they made a lot of duds. And I guess that was one of them. I was sure glad of that. Well, it says you spent some time in the 83rd Infantry Division, too? I wasn't long. After 26 coming home, with, okay. I got transferred over to the 83rd. 83rd, but... Th okay. Then after that went home, I went to the 384th MP outfit. Okay. We, we did, we take the mail to Vienna, from Salzburg to Vienna, on the train, carry the mail. And you, I think you said, too, you spent some time in the New England National Guard? Well... Uh, New England. Sichuan was, uh, what was that? 83rd. I forgot what it was. Okay, no, never mind. Never mind. Uh, well, what did, what did you do after the war as a, as a civilian? Oh, I went, uh, let's see, I came back. I worked for Sears Roebuck a little while. Okay. I went to work for, I worked for Westinger Chevrolet for four years. And I worked for Lehigh Garage, the body work, for about four years. And I worked for Jim McKay Chevrolet for 30 years. Wow. I, I retired from Jim McKay. Jim McKay. Okay. Uh-huh. That's I a do, long time. I was doing body work. Yeah. Auto body work. Okay. Well, Mr. Ferguson, we're kind of getting towards the end here. Is, All right. Is there... Um, one thing that you'd really like your, your grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren to know about you and your, your wartime service? Oh, I got a granddaughter. She's something now. She lives with me. My son and the, his, my, uh, my daughter-in-law and the granddaughter lives with me. She is a character. What would you like them to know or future generations to know about you? Well, I, got, I, st I still got a lot of me. I got my dress jacket. I still got my pants and my hat. And I got a, well, I got, like I said, I got an awful lot of European souvenirs that I brought back and I'm gonna pass them down to my, my granddaughter and them. Okay, I'm sure that will mean a lot to them. I may know it. Yeah, I got that. Like I said, I got a German flag. Okay. It's got the Iron Cross and swastika both on. Okay. But they say that's outlawed now. A swastika, yes. Yeah, I think I think if you keep it in the family, you're probably okay. And and your family, it, it'll mean a lot to your family. Yeah, coming, I got I got it at home here. in the box. I so I don't take it out. No. Okay. Yeah, I got an awful lot of European stuff. Was well, there anything else that um, you wanted to talk about, or we didn't cover, or? Well, I don't know. I tell you, the German people were nice and friendly after the war. They were, they were real nice and friendly. They well, went up there. A German soldier, we had him, they had him camped. We was, they was cutting wood for us. We were shipping it out, you know, but to the town. And he come up one day and had a $10 American bill. And he told me, he says, is this any good? I said, it ain't to you, but it is to me. Well, I gave him $10 in their money. And I took it to the black market and got a hundred dollars for it. Yeah. And inflation. Well, and uh, I think you told me too. Didn't you go back to Germany as a civilian in 1949? 1949, I went back. How was that? How, how what it was Germany like in 1949? And, and it, it was fine. I went back to see some people that I I met when I was in the army over there. I went over and stayed with this girl. I stayed with her about. About three months, then I told her I was going to Munich. I'd be back and never went back. Was there still a lot of damage in Germany? And, oh, yeah. And, and, uh, was, tough time still for some of the people? Yeah, it was. But houses, no roofs on them. Yeah. And things like that. I know this one girl up there at the end of where I told you, mom and father and there was that. She could, I went upstairs. I've been talking, she was real nice. I told her, I went upstairs, I come back down, she was crying. I said, what's the matter? She says, one of the GIs took her watch. Up the steps I went. I said, who got this girl's watch down here? And one of the boys said, I did. I took it away from him. I took it back down and handed it to her. I said, now you hide this. She was all right then. That's when she went out and fixed me a nice breakfast. Good for you. She did, fixed me some eggs, some breakfast and everything. But that family was, I mean, that was nice family, German. 
Well, it sounds like you made made a difference for some people over there. You did I, a lot of interesting things. I did. I I wasn't. I was a nice. It was, like I said, though, I wouldn't give ten cents to go over it again, but I wouldn't take a thousand dollars for the experience. That's a good way to look at it. Well, Mr. Ferguson, is there is there anything else you wanted to? I don't. I don't put know. on the. I know we after the war we used to we get we go up to the sergeant's desk up there and we'd get a carton of cigarettes for fifty cents. He'd sell it. Well, I tell some of the boys, you go up there and get your cigarettes and bring them to me. I give you twenty dollars a carton for them. Wow. And I'd get about thirty thirty five cartons and take them to Vienna. I get a hundred dollars a carton for them. So you're making some extra money. I'd make eighty dollars on each carton. Wow. I bought the first car I bought new for the estate. 46 Ford, 56 Ford, new, and paid cash for all the money I made over there. When you got back, yeah. Uh-huh. So. Bought me a 56 Ford, new. That's good. Well, Mr. Ferguson, I think uh, we can wrap the interview up. I want to give you this, though. This is a uh, a challenge coin from the museum. It is. Just hold it up to the camera real, fast, real quick. Just hold it up a little bit and a little bit in. There you go. Whoop. Whoop. What was that? It fell out. There we go. So here's your, your coin, and uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Americans in Wartime Museum for taking the time to interview with us today. It's been a pleasure. And, you want uh, me to keep it? That's for you to keep. I right, put it, Put it with your souvenirs, and again, thank you for your time, and thank you for your service. Oh, I got it.